this is part of our 2023 Naturalist Journeys series. I think our 27th year of this uh, program series here at North Branch Nature Center up in Montpelier, Vermont. Um, we want to thank our sponsors for making this whole series possible. So a big thanks to our lead sponsors, Hunger Mountain Co-op and 802 Coffee, uh, as well as all of our other sponsors that are making this possible, Union Mutual, Northfield Savings Bank, Capital Copy, Washington Electric, Onion River Outdoors, Concept2, Edward Jones Office of Keith LaCroix. Uh, it is a whole community endeavor to make this, uh, this Natural Journey series possible. This year, uh, we're changing things up a little bit from what we've done in the past. Um, we are having some of these talks on Tuesdays, some of them on Wednesdays, some of them in person, and some of them like this one um, online. Um, so keep a sharp eye on our calendar so that you know where and when to be. Um, but for most of the remaining Natural Journeys programs this year, they're going to be in person at North Branch. Um, maybe not all of them, but most of them are going to be uh, at North Branch. And uh, this year we have tickets required. They're free tickets, but we ask that folks get tickets in advance so that we can just make sure we have a uh, a safe number of people um, in, the, in the space so that people can feel comfortable and, and welcome there. Um, so if you're interested in, in uh, joining us for the rest of the series, everything from travel photography to moose and wolves to, uh, to um, Vermont bee diversity, landscape history, uh, deer tick ecology, um, if that's your jam, then join us at the Nature Center and you can check all that out on our website. And the recordings of all of our Natural Journeys programs are on our website as well at northbranchnaturecenter.org slash presentations. I'll throw that into the chat at some point here um, so that people can have that. So if your technology peters out or something goes wrong or you want to share this with a friend later, you can always go to the presentations page and, uh, and check it out later. So um, there'll be a Q&A portion at the end of tonight's program. So feel free to use the, uh, the Q&A uh, function within your Zoom webinar settings here to ask any questions that you'd like, and then um, I'll moderate those for Simone when we get to the end of the end of the talk. Um, so with that, um, all of that that stuff out of the way, uh, it's our pleasure to welcome Simone. Simone, thank you so much for um, for spending time with us tonight and sharing your your research and your work with us here at the Nature Center. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to sharing my research with you tonight. Um, so I wanted to get started with some beautiful flower pictures. Who doesn't like to think about green things in the middle of winter? Um, this is actually a photograph that came from the White Mountains. This is from the Alpine Garden. And one of the things that's really special about our Alpine area is the fact that a lot of the plants there, about 30% are actually Arctic relics. So that's gonna be our tie this evening is that these are plants you can actually go and see um, here in our own backyard. I do wanna recognize and acknowledge that the lands from which we gather are the traditional territories of native peoples prior to their forced removal. These lands continue to carry the stories of these nations and their struggles for survival and identity. We honor and respect the many diverse indigenous people still connected to these lands, which we now call home. And this photo here is actually of the Greenland ice sheet. So in the background, you can see sort of white fading to gray. In front of that is a moraine. So that's earth that was pushed up by the ice sheet. And then in the foreground is the pink flower, the national flower of Greenland, uh, Niviarsia. So I did wanna give a little bit of background on who I am and how I got to where I am today. Um, this is another photo from the Alpine zone um, in the White Mountains. So my family is from the Lactiflambo band of Lake Superior Chippewa in Wisconsin. The photograph on the left is of my father's sister, my aunt Karen and her husband, Michael. So the two of them brought our tradition, of, <coughs> excuse me, traditional spiritual ways back into our family. Um, and it's because of them that I first learned about using plants as medicines, not only as medicines for physical pains, but for spiritual pains as well. And so we have plants that we'll use um, during sacred ceremonies that we may smoke, we may chew. Um, and so I, I appreciate plants as a, a special healing that they bring to me. Um, so that's sort of the native spiritual side of me. And then the other side is the science side of me. And so the photograph on the right is taken on Franconia Ridge. This was me um, doing some of my PhD work. I was a 
graduate student at Dartmouth College. And while I was there, I was interested in understanding how plants of different types, so different species interact. Are they competing for resources or are they facilitating each other? And one of the hypotheses is that in extreme environments, such as an alpine zone where it's very, very windy in our case, um, you're more likely to find examples of facilitation. And so I spent uh, four field seasons working up there doing experiments and trying to understand what the dynamics were between two plants in particular, Diapensia laponica and Vaccinium uliginosum, which is a, a alpine or mountain bilberry. While I was there, I was also getting the chance to get to know the plants, um, which were also then alpine, excuse me, Arctic plants. And because of my Dartmouth experience, um, I was involved in a training program. So this is a photograph of my cohort um, that was, it's, we're standing in front of the Greenland ice sheet. We were part of an interdisciplinary training program that was themed around polar environmental change. And this is what got me to Greenland. So the team I'm pictured with, we were ecologists, earth scientists, and engineers. And we spent a year taking coursework to prepare us for doing interdisciplinary research in Greenland. And one of the things besides learning about each other's disciplines was that we were also taught to think about the human side of things. So we had a policy aspect to what we were doing. And that's what sort of paved the way for me to have permission to steer from strictly ecology, which is the program I was in, to having this human component of humans and their uses in, in terms of plants. So the project that I mentioned, the training program, was funded through the National Science Foundation, and that is who paid for the research that I'll be presenting today. My colleague, Dr. Lenore Grenoble, who is a linguist and a specialist in endangered languages, um, was funded through the Humanities Division at the University of Chicago. So I want to make sure that I thank both of those organizations for funding the project. And the photo here is another picture of Niviarsiak, also known as fireweed. So the things that we'll cover today, um, first, I want to get you acquainted with Arctic plants. And then I want you to think about peoples and languages of the Arctic and how those relate to Arctic plants. That'll sort of set the framework for the fundamental questions that we asked in our research. Um, the fourth thing I'll present will be to discuss how we documented knowledge among the Inuit in Greenland. And then lastly, we have some analysis um, that was done by my colleague, Dr. Lenore Grenoble, in terms of how the Inuit are classifying the things around them. How are they organizing and understanding the plants? Um, and so I'll end on some of that. So the three things about plants and peoples in the North that I'd like you to keep in mind are that First of all, Arctic plants are circumpolar. So that means that throughout anywhere in the Arctic, most of the plants are gonna be the same. If you're in Siberia or if you're in Alaska or Northern Canada, most of the plants are similar. So the second thing to keep in mind is that there are indigenous peoples that live in these places where these plants are. And unlike the fact that the plants are mostly similar, these are different indigenous peoples with different languages. And I have some maps to show you that'll help clarify this. And then the third thing is that there have been recent migrations of these indigenous peoples. And this is particularly true in North America. And that's where um, some of the seeds for thought about my research projects were planted because of these recent migrations. So the Arctic flora is rather depauperate. There are only 1500 plant species throughout the Arctic. Um, which means it's very easy to show up there and become an expert quickly, which was good because I, all in all, probably spent uh, seven weeks in Greenland. 60% um, of those plants are the same throughout the circumpolar region, but once you go above the Arctic Circle, 90% of those plants are the same. And here's a map that shows you the floristic provinces of the Arctic. Um, I want to center you first on how to look at this map. It's probably a little different um, a way of thinking about the Northern Hemisphere. So the center of the map is the North Pole. And uh, in the upper left-hand corner, you can see Alaska. 
And then moving down the left-hand side is Northern Canada. At the bottom left corner is Greenland, which is mostly white because it's covered in an ice sheet. And then along the right-hand side is um, Siberia. So the different colors represent different floristic provinces, meaning that there are some species difference, but the important thing is you can see there are lots of plants um, covering the land up there. Now this map is the same view, so looking down on the North Pole. However, instead of there being different um, floristic provinces, these are the different indigenous peoples that live across the Arctic. I'd like to draw your attention to the area in blue. So with my cursor, um, you can see in Northern Alaska that the dark blue represents the Inuit and that dark blue moves all the way across Canada and into Greenland. So the Inuit of Alaska are related to the Inuit of Greenland. And the reason this is, is because their ancestors were the Thule people. And the Thule people uh, were living in Alaska and then in a climatic warming period about 1300 years ago, they migrated. So this is this migration that I was talking about. 1300 years ago is not that long ago. And so they were following blow-headed whales during a climactic warming period where the ice, um, the sea ice receded. And during that migration, they basically left inhabitants all along the way as they moved and then finally ended in, in Greenland. And so what that means is that linguistically, these communities are very similar. And you can kind of think of it um, as a linguistic family that's like a chain so that the links of the chain that are next to each other are most similar. So the Inuit spoken in uh, Alaska is more similar to its neighbors in Canada and the Alaskan Inuit versus the Greenlandic Inuit are most different. And I'll give you an example of this a little bit later, what that means for um, words having slightly different pronunciations. So I wanted to talk a little bit about Greenland just to give you some background. So the left photo is a picture of um, two women in their traditional attire. The, the Inuit of Greenland are, were subsistence hunters and relied primarily on marine mammals for foods. However, they were colonized by the Danes over 400 years ago. And so the picture on the right is what is called the national costume. And so you can see that there are strong Scandinavian influences on their culture now. And that has implications in terms of what sort of knowledge they hold about plants as foods and medicines. So the traditional diet that I mentioned um, was not only primarily meat-based, but was primarily um, marine mammal. However, 5% of that diet was still plants. And so this was sort of one of the thoughts that made me think, okay, if only 5% of their diet was plants, they were still important enough that they were included in these diets. And uh, one of the favorite treats was actually berries, which would be preserved in seal fat in a seal bladder, and then could be eaten in the dead of winter. So the pictures I'm gonna share now um, are from a gathering that I attended while I was in Greenland called the Cafe Mik. It's a social event um, where they eat traditional foods. The picture on the left is of um, minky whale blubber, the skin. So this is a special treat um, that's called matak. And on the right is the skin of a beluga whale. Um, and I said earlier, I would give you an example of the language family uh, chain and the differences between Alaskan and Greenlandic Inuit. So where in Greenland it's matak, the word in Alaskan is muktuk. So similar, but different. Um, the image on the left is seal fat. So this is a, a delicacy um, for the people of Greenland. And on the right is uh, salted seabird eggs. And you can also see there's some dried fish on the table there. Um, they also will eat minky or whale steaks in general. The picture on the left is actually of um, a minky whale. And then what was interesting is that the way that it was prepared is shown on the right. And so this is just with mashed potatoes and it was cooked with onions and um, mushrooms. And uh, if at the end we have time and there aren't questions, I can tell you a funny story about um, 
trying to eat minky whale or making it look like I was eating minky whale while I was in Greenland. Um, a little bit of background about the language. So the um, Inuit language in Greenland is called Kalasisut, and the LL is sort of like a lateral lisp, a sound, so it's Kalasisut. Um, and this is the West Greenlandic dialect. It's the official language. So 88% of the people speak it. Um, those who don't are often Danes who are living in Greenland. Uh, when I last looked at the numbers, it was about 56,000 people total living in Greenland and 6,000 of them were Danish. So it's the language of the government and the media, meaning there's Greenlandic TV, there's Greenlandic radio, and there's Greenlandic newspapers. And it's also what students learn first in school, um, which is important in terms of thinking about uh, endangered languages. Greenlandic is not considered an endangered language, although modern technology and texting is sort of changing that because the words are very long in Greenlandic. And so the teenagers are preferring to text in Danish. Um, and then lastly, both Kalafisut and Danish are used in Greenland, and there's increasing use of English. So given this information that I've shared with you, this is what led to sort of the fundamental questions that we asked. The first was thinking back to that migration along that area of blue on the map, how did plant names and uses change with that migration? Did it stay the same or did it evolve as these peoples were moving across the Arctic? What knowledge do people have about plants and their uses? So because Greenland was colonized, how much of that uh, knowledge has been lost? I do also wanna say that Greenland is unique among the Inuit cultures because the language is very strong, but their cultural ways are not as strong. Across the rest of um, the Inuit region, culture is very strong, but language has been lost. And so this was this question of like, well, how much do they still know? Because they've been um, living a very European lifestyle for a long time. So in terms of answering that question, we needed to know the third question we have here, which is what are the sources of this knowledge? How are they learning about plants? Um, we also wanted to know how this knowledge has been affected by contact. And I have a couple interesting stories about that. And then lastly, what do the plant names tell us about Inuit taxonomy? So how are they classifying the world? How do they see things and understand um, how to make sense of things? So in terms of uh, what we were able to find, this photo here is Nuuk, that's in UUK. It's the capital of Greenland. This photo was actually taken in 2011. The skyline has changed a lot since then. So you can see, if you look closely, there's at least five cranes. Nuuk was growing very quickly. Um, most people were, or not most, but lots of people were leaving small settlements spread throughout the country to move to the capital. Um, and one thing that was changing for people in Greenland as a whole was that they were actually moving away from rule by Denmark. And so now they're actually under self-rule. And because of that, they have a strong desire to be seen as modern. And when we first started asking our contacts in Greenland, you know, what do you know about plants or do you know anyone who uses them as, as foods or medicines? They would often say, oh, no, no, no. Those are the old ways. We're modern now. And there was a lot of um, pride in seeing themselves as modern. Um, we were able to find that there were published sources of knowledge. And so here's a list of various things we found. There was a, um, a Danish guide to food and drink of Greenlandic plants. There were published field guides, including one that was in Greenlandic and in Danish. Um, we also found other references that were not Greenland specific. So a published source by Walks of Alasi was actually from uh, in Inuktitut, so from Canada. And then um, we were able to find inter interviews that had been saved by the Greenland National Archives and Museum, as well as scientific articles that had been um, funded by the Air Force during the Cold War to look for plants that could be used for survival foods in the event that a pilot went down somewhere over the Arctic. 
Um, and then lastly, there were various anthropological and ethnographic accounts we found. And so we have this background of information, but what do Greenlanders actually hold as knowledge about plants? Fortunately, we were able to find people who did have knowledge. Um, we went to two places in Southern Greenland. So Kasiasuk is the upper star. That was a small settlement of 86 people. It's a sheep herding settlement. Um, and there we stayed with the matriarch of the settlement. And then Nenortalik is a town of 1800 that has its own heliport. Or oh, I should say Kasiasuk was only uh, accessible by boat. You have to take a boat up the fjord to get to the settlement. So Nenortalik was more of a, a big town. Um, they had roads and cars, for instance. So we went to these two places and there we had contacts that we had made and were able to meet with them and conduct interviews to get information about uh, what knowledge they held regarding plants and their uses. So we had informal conversations with them often over tea and then also did in, like a, a formal interview where we had semi-structured questions and then also did an open-ended interview of just like, tell us what you know about plants. Um, we also did a dialect documentation and this was because of my colleague who's the linguist, she was very interested in um, recording how the names were pronounced. Um, we did also have casual conversations. You can't keep me from talking to people about plants. So anybody I met, I was like, well, do you know about plants? Um, but we didn't include that in the results that we're going to be uh, sharing today. So we were able to find 171 uses of plants, which feels like a win, given that at first we were told that nobody uses these plants anymore. Um, there were 50 taxa of vascular plants and bryophytes, so those are mosses. There were fungal uses of fungi as well and seaweeds. And then just to get a sense of the span of what they're using, there were 26 different plant families, 21 or 26 different families, so that's including the fungi and seaweeds, and 21 vascular plant families out of 60 total found in the country. So about a third of the plants there had known uses. And there were 32 genera of plants. One thing that I found very touching, this is a photo of tea. So every person that we interviewed had some sort of tea that they had collected from, from the land. That's how they would say, we got this from the land. And so um, in some cases they would take leaves from different plants and combine them, or it would be just one single form. Um, this was actually at a two-room schoolhouse in the settlements, Kasiasuk, um, where they had a variety of different teas that they were very happy to offer us. Um, in terms of the data that we collected, um, this is just an example of the table that went into the publication about this, describing uh, Angelica Archangelica. Uh, which in Kalachisut is called Kuanek. And we would report what the part of the plant was and how it was used. Um, and then we had them assigned to categories. And so in this case, um, the first one is they would use the leaf chopped, sprinkled on top of salmon or fish or potatoes. And I'll show you some pictures of some of these uses uh, later in the talk. So um, the uses by category, right? So how are these plants used? The predominant use was medicine. Um, a lot of these were as teas. In some cases, they would be used as poultices. Um, for those of you who are familiar with Labrador tea, which is one that we have that grows here and grows over in Labrador and lots of parts of Canada, um, that was one of their favorite medicine plants. Um, and then the second use was food. So berries are, you know, every who doesn't love a berry? So there was a lot of berry uses, um, but also a lot of um, instances of using them sort of as condiments. In terms of beverages, it was always a tea. Um, and then crafts, there were a few instances where we saw flowers pulled together into um, 
a, a wreath for a funeral or they will build it because there are no trees it's the arctic they will build a wooden frame and then there's a juniper that grows prostrate so laying flat on the ground they'll cut the branches of the juniper and fix it to the frame to look like a christmas tree so they'll make their own christmas trees um the other one i wanted to mention was contraindication so there were a few examples where they would say oh you know if you use angelica on this kind of fish you'll get sick so there were specific ways um, where you didn't want to use these plants in terms of the ritual this is one that spoke to me because i know plants through ritual right i know like smudging for instance lighting sage and brushing the smoke on my body the ritual example that was shared with us was from a woman um, whose uncle was a shaman. And uh, it, it's illegal to be a shaman in the country. Um, everyone uh, um, was sort of either forced to go underground with their practices or stop them entirely. But she said that she knew her uncle had juniper that he would use similarly. He would light it on fire and then use the smoke to clean out bad spirits is what she said. And then lastly, for unknown, we had uh, two instances where a woman said, oh, I know my grandmother used to use that plant, but I don't remember what for. Um, so in terms of, this is just to get a sense of like, well, how much knowledge is out there and what do people know? You can see that there was a span. So each number on the X axis represents one of our consultants. And so consultant number five knew the most. Um, I can tell you that consultant number five worked at the archives and had access to interviews of elders from um, uh, an assisted living facility. And so she had published documentation that she was drawing from in terms of her knowledge. Um, and I wanted just to let you get a better sense of what these plants are and how they're used. A little bit of background on Angelica Archangelica. So this is a plant that's in the carrot family. Um, it is a plant that is known to have medicinal uses in other cultures, different gene, uh, different species, but same genus. So other Angelica plants in Chinese medicine, Dong Kwai is one that is an Angelica plant that's used um, very often. Um, and for me, Angelica, we use the roots as bear medicine. So this is one where we will dry the root and chew the root during sweat ceremonies, or we will grind the root and sprinkle it on the rocks during the sweat, or even put it into tobacco for smoking with our pipe. Um, so this is a plant that has known spiritual and medicinal uses. Um, here's that table I showed you before. Um, what I want to highlight here is that if you look in the category, it's food, food, spice, food, 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 and the majority of what we found for Angelica um, did not have spiritual use or medicinal use. It was primarily as a food or spice. So this is one way in which uh, a plant that has medicinal properties is used differently in other cultures. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that and the effects of Danish colonialism in relation to that. So here is Angelica prepared in a marmalade. Um, this is not a traditional Inuit preparation at all. This was definitely a uh, you know, Western European influence on uh, Inuit culture. This was something that the matriarch that we stayed with in Kasiasuk made with us. We went out into the field and harvested some and um, she showed us how to make this. These are the seeds of Angelica. Um, for scale, they're probably half the size of a pea. And this was a twin bed sheet spread on the floor and covered in these. So that's just to get a sense of how much these are valued. So this was a family that would dry them and then um, grind them uh, while they were green and put them in like a salt shaker on the table as a condiment uh, or also dry them like until they were yellow and do the same thing. The leaves are also used as a condiment. So these are hanging in the two room classroom and in Kasiasa or two room schoolhouse. Um, 
The students there ranged from first to eighth grade. And while we were there, they uh, were sort of doing a unit on plant uses. And so everyone went out into the fields together and harvested together. And then they were hanging these in the classroom to dry. And then um, they would also potentially be used as a tea as well. Another use was to actually have them candied. So these are the stalks and they were candied and preserved, um, which again is a, a Danish method of preparation and not a traditional Inuit use. And interestingly enough, this is a photo I took in the duty-free part of the airport when we were returning from Greenland in Copenhagen. And so um, this is a picture of Angelica. And I found it very striking that this plant, which was of cultural importance to the people of Greenland as a food source, is also obviously culturally important enough to show up in a duty-free store in the airport. Um, and to me, that really signified the um, importance of the plant for the Danes and made me wonder how important the plant was for the people of Greenland, independent of Danish influence. We really weren't able to find any examples of sort of traditional Inuit uses. Um, and so in terms of thinking about knowledge lost, this to me implies that there is knowledge that has been lost. Like what were the traditional uses of these um, plants? I mentioned earlier that there were other references that we used and one of them was um, a document that recognized that there were shaman who would take the root of Angelica and wear it as a talisman to protect himself from polar bears. So there was at some point a traditional spiritual connection to this plant as well. Um, but that knowledge has been lost. So the fundamental questions um, that we asked were, have the plant names and uses changed because of these migrations? Has this knowledge been changed by contact? And then what do they tell us about taxonomy? So this is where I wanted to speak about taxonomy. Um, In the field guide that they have in Greenland, there are uh, a scientific name. So the Linnaean classification system that you're probably familiar with, like we are Homo sapiens. There's also a Danish name and then a Kalafusut name that was given. And this um, book would have a description of the plant in Danish and Kalafusut, a sketch of the plant and a map showing where it occurs. Uh, and if you're curious, there is a link there. I don't know. Um, Maybe at the end, I can try to copy that and put it in the chat if folks are interested. Um, anyhow, in terms of uh, classification, so the sort of Western Linnaean uh, classification would take a birch and classify it in the family Betulaceae. For the Danes, the name would be Birkenfamilian, so the birch family. And in Kalathisut, it would be Avalakia. Here, we're just gonna focus on how they were classified among the Inuit. And we found that there were patterns where they were classified based on visual characteristics. So they would be characterized by color or by size or shape or resemblance to things. And this could be to objects or to animals. And then we did find another example of classifications based on other sensory characteristics, in this case, taste. And then um, I was very hopeful that there would be names that reflected the uses of the plants, but we found very few of those. I, I was hopeful that the use could somehow, even if the knowledge had been lost, that use could still be locked into the name. So um, one of these examples was regarding the color yellow, sungortok, um, and that comes from sungak meaning bile. So that's the origin of yellow. But then for these three different family uh, plants, so there's a poppy on the left, um, there's a buttercup in the middle and a buttercup on the right. These were all given names that reflected the fact that they were yellow. So there was the big yellow one, which was Sungor Tosok. There was the small yellow one, where you can see again has Sungor Tok in it, but it's become Sungor Tuak, sorry, Sungor Tuarok. 
Um, and then the smaller yellow one, which is Sungor Tortia. So we also mentioned that there were examples of names that were based on shape. And this is Labrador tea. So again, maybe this is one folks know, um, it has an amazing smell. And in this case, uh, the name would end in U-S-A-Q, meaning one that resembles something. So if you look at the leaves of these plants, they're very long and skinny and rather pointed. And so um, kayaks are actually, or kayaks as you know them, or Inuit. So um, this plant is named kayasak, meaning it looks like a kayak. And that's to compare this. So I, I should say this is a, a rhododendron species. And this is another rhododendron species, but the leaves are very round. And in this case, the name reflects that roundness by saying it looks like a tongue. So the tongue is okak, and this becomes okasak because it looks like a tongue. One other example, um, this is a bluebell. I've seen these growing in people's gardens here. Um, one could say that this looks like a thimble. And so this is uh, tikisak. Um, some concluding thoughts on what we learned in our study. The first is that the Inuit of Greenland are reconstructing knowledge of plant uses. So the women that we met and interviewed at the two room schoolhouse actually had a Xeroxed copy of a field guide that a Danish woman had made for herself of plant uses that had newspaper clippings that she would have from Danish newspapers about uses, had notes in her, um, just in the margins about it. And this is what we, my colleague and I called the Bible, the plant Bible. And we found several people throughout Greenland that had Xeroxed copies of this. And they were all happy to have it because they wanted the plant knowledge, but they didn't actually have it. They needed a resource to use to learn it. So they're reconstructing it in that. They also were particularly interested to know about my knowledge of plant uses. They were just thirsty for more knowledge. That gets at the second point. They're not particularly concerned about the source. They just want to know more. So it's not as they're, they're like traditional purists and they want to only know Inuit uses. They just want to know how to use the plants. Um, they are not particularly concerned with spiritual uses of plants, but are very interested in medicinal and food uses. Um, there's this note too. They've been especially interested in my own expertise, which was fun because then I got to feel kind of like a rock star. Um, the people are likely to know the names of the plants they use. So there were not instances of people saying, oh yeah, you can make tea out of this one, but I don't know what it's called. They would know the name. There were instances where the Danish name was more likely to be given. So Tuparnak is thyme. And then there's a delicious Greenlandic thyme that grows all over the Arctic um, or the vegetated areas of Greenland. And they would not refer to it as Tuparnak. They would refer to it as Timian, which is the Danish name. Um, another thing that we drew as a conclusion or observed was just that they are less likely to know plants that they don't use. So in these cases, they would just give a generic name. So if there was a grass, uh, for instance, some of you may know sweetgrass, which people will use um, to burn uh, for spiritual cleansing or spiritual strength. Native Americans do here. Um, there is one uh, in the same genus that grows in Greenland. No one knew that one. And at best, they would only identify it as Evie, which is just a grass. Um, they also will invent a name on the fly. So if they didn't know, they would just say, oh, that's the small green one or, or small yellow one, or that's the big yellow one. And fortunately, they were also comfortable enough to say they didn't know. So that meant we didn't have to worry that they were just making up answers in order to provide one. Um, and with that, I will say koyanak, which is thank you in Greenlandic, and I will take questions. Thanks so much, Simone. Um, as we give folks a chance to add questions into the Q&A, I think that gives us just enough time to ask you about the story of uh, eating minky whale. 
<laughs> oh my gosh. So um, the picture that was on the first slide and on the flyer of this event, um, I'm six and a half months pregnant in that photo. So when we went on this trip, it was 2011. I was actually hopeful that the fact that I was pregnant might help trigger more stories about plant uses. Um, that was not the case. But um, given that I was pregnant, that meant that I would also be much more susceptible to any toxins in foods, right? And mercury levels are high in whales. And the matriarch of our, uh, that we were staying with in Kasiasuk, she had actually hosted the queen of Denmark. So she was, you know, she was very excited to have us there, very much a hostess, and of course, wanting to feed us the best food she could, including these minky whale steaks. So she served us this feast and I didn't want to eat it. You know, I was like, I, I don't want to eat this because there's mercury in it. And so um, she gave us each, my Lenore was there across the table from me and uh, she was at the head of the table. So I, I did take one bite, I did try a bite. And then she got up to get something out of the kitchen and I put my steak on Lenore's plate while she wasn't looking. And Lenore just like ate the whole thing. So she comes back to the table, sees the pregnant lady who's finished her steak and gets a second steak. So Lenore ended up eating two steaks plus the third steak. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of meat. I mean, they were, that was three servings for sure of, of steak. So she took one for the team for sure. Uh, it was probably pretty tasty if, uh, if you weren't pregnant. Yeah. I'm concerned about mercury. Uh, well, thanks. Okay, so some great questions coming in. Um, Allison's asking, Simone, were there plants you saw that aren't being used by the native people, but which could be? Uh, well, so the Angelica is one example, right? So that's one that I know how to use spiritually, but they didn't. Um, and then there's also the sweetgrass example that I just mentioned. So that's one that they could, you know, they could braid and dry and use. Um, my uncle has taught me actually to also use it to make teas. Um, and that was one that they weren't using. A se separate sort of, I, well, I guess it's true. So there's a plant that grows here called eyebright. And what was interesting about that one, and this is also in thinking about tying um, where their knowledge about uses is coming from. So their name of it was a translation from Danish which also calls it eyebright into Greenlandic. So it was called eyebright reflecting the Danish name and not an Inuit name. Um, so, and that's one that they didn't know how to use either. I was wondering about that as well when you were saying the, uh, the, um, you know, the Inuit name for one plant being the yellow one and the small yellow one and the smaller yellow one. I was wondering if there's maybe a lot of cases where the, where the original language for the original name for a plant was lost and has been kind of replaced by, you know, a, a stand in that either comes from Danish or comes from just, you know, need, needing a new name to refer to it by. And, and if you could kind of sense that from people's uh, names for things. Um, well, the eyebright example I gave was sort of the most pronounced. Um, but I do have a, a separate story that's uh, sort of an indicator the other direction. So um, the photo that was the in the opening slide, uh, that picture with me and Lenore, is actually standing in front of Norse ruins. So that was those were ruins that were about or around abandoned around 900 um, BCE or sorry AC Common Era, and uh, it's unclear what the dynamics were between the Inuit and the Norse, right? Was there animosity or was there a friendship? And so um, typically it's been assumed that uh, there were friendly relations between them. And one of the things that has been used is the name of Angelica as evidence of that, because that name is Kuanek and K-U-A-N, uh, they believed was derived from Norse, Fran. Um, and so they said, oh, look, see, this is an evidence of there being like positive relations. They have this name that's based on a Danish, a Norse plant. 
Um, however, in doing our archival research, we were actually able to show that if you look across that language chain, there were other cultures, other Inuit cultures that used Kuanek as a plant name. Mm. It was a seaweed, but it was a plant name. So um, we were really excited to be like, hey, you know, maybe those relations weren't necessarily friendly or you at least can't say that looking at this name because it's not necessarily based on the Norse. Yeah. Uh, let's see some other questions coming in. Um, let's see, oh, okay. So uh, two unrelated questions here from Sandal. Uh, what will you be doing from this point with your studies and are children being taught plants and their uses? Um, so at this point with the studies, I'm actually meeting with Lenore on Friday because we never published the taxonomy results. We only published on the um, uses, and, and that's something that's available to the public. Um, so we're going to publish the results in the taxonomy. And uh, beyond that, I'm not quite sure. Um, it would be great to get back to Greenland. Um, and conduct the research in other parts of the country. We only went to Southern Greenland and you know the cultures, there's different communities. And on the East side, it's actually a different dialect. And then in Northern uh, Greenland, it's a different dialect as well. And then your second question was, are the children being taught plants and their uses? I can't speak for the country, but I know that in Kasiasuk, in that two room schoolhouse, the children were most definitely being taught about um, the uses. I should also say that the country is still 25% uh, relies 25% uh, on of their diet on subsistence hunting. And part of that means that they also go into the country is what they say. Um, and they often have like a camp where they go every year and they go hunting. And there are usually also berry patches around. So at minimum, kids are learning to go harvest berries and um, then often uh, one way they'll prepare them is to mix them with seal fat, which I mentioned before, but they call that Inuit ice cream. <laughs> nice. Um, was, I was curious, you know, in that, in that vein, um, you said that there was not so much interest in learning spiritual uses of these plants as opposed to food and medicine uses. Is there a connection there between, you know, that and this um, interest in modernizing and then you know history of, of Danish colonization. I'm just wondering what you think might explain why there was not there's really not a lot of interest in in learning new spiritual uses. Yeah, um, I would think that it could be that most people because they've been colonized for so long are Christian now, so there's not that sort of interest. Um, and then also the desire to be seen as modern. Although in the time, so I first went there in 2009 and then had colleagues going until 2017-ish. Um, there was a, sort of a rebirth as part of this idea of being self-rule and self-sufficient. They were re-engaging with the idea of being able to get food from the land. And so I think that there's actually great growing, just as there is here, right? Like a lot of people want a homestead and, you know, people want a wild craft. There was an increasing interest in that, um, in particular about the, the time, Tuparnak, that I mentioned. Everybody wanted to go and get some, you know, like, oh, well, we have our own time. And there was actually a woman um, who was sort of recognized as the ambassador of food, who would teach people on on radio interviews or on TV about how to use food from the land um, hmm. as spices or how to prepare various dishes. Um, a couple of kind of ecology questions. Um, folks are wondering, are uh, Arctic plants and their distributions linked to the geology, the surrounding geology? I don't know the answer to that. I mean, as a plant ecologist, I would think potentially yes, right? If the soils are more acidic because of the geology, you'd probably have different plants. You'd have more heath, you know, acid loving plants. Um, but I don't know. And actually that map that I had of the floristic provinces, I don't know how much that reflects changes in geology um, in terms of the bedrock. 
And I guess related, I wonder how much of the plant distributions are really limited by other more pressing factors like extreme temperatures and winds and, and you know, lack of water and that sort of thing. And if that, you know, if, you know, a, a, um, you know, a plant has to have a luxurious life to be able to worry about what, what rock it's growing on, it means that it's already survived being in Greenland in the first place. <laughs> um, and uh, so that, that's actually related to another um, question here is, um, as we feel the effects of, of global warming and climate change and more um, kind of land being exposed in Greenland, um, is, what is that doing to uh, plant communities? And is there um, concerns around uh, invasive species colonizing those kind of newly available habitats? Um, so I actually, kept a slide at the end of my talk in case someone asked a question kind of like this. Um, and so it's a map, it's two maps actually, and I'll share it, that show um, what models are predicting in terms of the greening of the Arctic in response to climate change. Um, can you see my screen okay? Yep. Okay, and actually I'm gonna stop my video for one second because it looks like my battery is going to die, but I can answer and talk at the same time. So um, the picture on the left, you can see that the um, sort of purpley color is the tundra. And the picture on the right is where the vegetation has expanded. And you can see there's a lot less purple and a lot more green. So that's all now vegetated areas. So that's you know, in 2090 that we're going to expect to see that change. And um, in terms of invasive species, yes, there will be invasive species coming. What else does that mean for Greenland in terms of losing ice? It means that um, there are a lot more opportunities for uh, resource extraction. And that's actually been a big debate in Greenland is that um, there's interest in putting in a uranium mine or mine. Um, and there are a lot of rubies actually there that are um, becoming available as the ice is melting. So I think, does that get at the question entirely? I think it was a multi-parted question. Yeah, I think it, I think it does. Um, and one moment, I'm just reading a follow-up from the question asker. Um, Oh, yeah. Um, so Sandal's asking um, if I can uh, capture the link that's currently on the screen at the bottom there and put that into the chat. Uh, folks, what I'll do is there's been a couple of great links that you've shared, Simone, um, and um, I'll grab those when I put up the recording and I'll have them hyperlinked below the recording so folks can access that. I'll also put a link to your, um, your uh, research papers as well um, in there. So if you go to our presentations page and, and find this talk, you'll, uh, you'll find all, the, all these links below that too. So yeah, thanks. Thanks for suggesting that. Um, let's see, a couple more questions if you have time for it, Simone. Sure. Let's see. Um, Caitlin's asking, is there a good resource for medicinal uses of these plants that is accessible to the general public? Uh, well, there's my paper, <laughs> but no, that's actually because a lot of our findings were more about foods and not so much as medicines. Although the medicinal uses are described, Labrador tea is often used for um, respiratory ailments. Uh, so that is available. Um, let's see, the Missouri Botanic Garden actually has a very detailed website with plant uses. Um, it's a digitized version of a manual. And then um, actually that 1953 paper, well, that's more food specific um, by Porcelt is another one that you can just Google and find. Did you get a chance to go into some of those um, oral histories and audio recordings yourself in your research? Um, I did not get to do any of the audio recordings. I did uh, get to see the transcript of the recorded um, visit with the folks at the uh, assisted living place. Although this was all in Greenlandic. I mean, even if I could have heard it, I wouldn't have understood it. I didn't mention, we actually um, 
in some cases had a hired translator with us because the people we were speaking with did not speak Greenlandic, hmm. uh, or sorry, did not speak English. And so we had to rely on a translator. Uh, let's see uh, if anybody has any last questions. Now is your chance to throw them into the chat here. Let me just look over my notes one more time here. It looks like there is one. Are our local Arctic plants on mountaintops comparable to the Arctic Circle plants? Have our plants evolved? Um, I don't know the answer to that question. If we think about the last ice age, so it's been 10,000 years, it's enough time, 13,000 years for there to be um, evolution. Certainly there's gonna be changes in which pollinators are available. There are Arctic bumblebees, um, but we have different bumblebees here. So that would mean probably things that are bee pollinated could be changing over time. Um, but I don't have like a specific example of someone having studied that. Oh, well, that's interesting thinking about these plants like you said, 90% of the ones above the Arctic Circle, did you say, are circum circumpolar? Mm -hmm. And yet, not only are the you know indigenous communities, uh, you know, varied and, and many across the world, but pollinator communities are as well. Those are not necessarily circum circumpolar. That would be an interesting study to see how different, how the same plant in different regions, um, you know, interact with different pollinator communities. a good PhD thesis for you. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, in five years, I'll give a talk on the, <laughs> the findings. <laughs> well, um, Simone, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thanks for sharing your, your, uh, your research with us. Um, it is a pleasure to get to spend some time with you, learning from you. Um, we look forward to welcoming you to Montpelier in real life in a few weeks. So, um, so safe travels up here. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining us tonight. You can find the recording on our website in a couple of days here. Uh, if you have any questions, you can reach out to us, uh, send us an email. And again, so I want to say one last word of thanks to our sponsors, Hunger Mountain Co-op, 802 Coffee, and all the other great folks um, that make this all possible. And uh, yeah, one last time, Simone, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Okay. Good night, everybody. Bye.